Welcome to Big Talk, a series of power talks by industry and thought leaders that inspire progress and unlock innovation. Big Talk, unlocking the next big thing. Thank you very much. Uh, just wait a second for the slides to come up. But uh, I thought I'd start off, um, start off the talk with uh, a nice uh, view of Bulawayo. In my opinion, uh, one of the best uh, cities in the world. Uh, but sadly, um, if you took that picture 20 years ago, uh, it would probably look exactly the same. Um, and I kind of feel that's where, uh, that's where all the work needs to be done. Um, tonight, I'm, I'm pretty much sharing, I would say I've, I've not got a scripted talk as such. I'm going to use the slides to kind of uh, go through a few things. Um, my sort of little um, rider here is that uh, these thoughts are completely my own, so I, I apologize in advance uh, for not being at PhD level or anything like that, but... Uh, as MP has already introduced, it's just I'm trying to put some ideas out there and hopefully it's, uh, it's, it's beneficial for all of us. But I thought it's quite nice um, when we look at Bulawayo, um, it's always quite nice to kind of go back and, and just say, well, how did we get uh, to Bulawayo in the first place? Um, so I thought we'd start with um, hopefully a reasonably well-known picture. People should recognize him, Zilakazi Kamalo. Um, he, he obviously, um, in about 1920, uh, broke away from uh, the control of Shaka in, in Natal, and he headed up uh, to the Transvaal. He was a bit of a pest, really, uh, for most of the people on the way, um, they, and they really were not so keen on him being camped out there. But he, uh, he hung around, he, he was really good at picking spots. Actually, that's probably what I'm trying to get to with Bulawayo, is he picked uh, a great spot in what is now Gauteng, uh, which is almost exactly where Pretoria is. So he pretty much picked... Um, the, the capital of South Africa, uh, as his place to be. But in the 1936, you had a couple of things happening. Uh, you had uh, the, the Fuhr Trekkers uh, coming out of the Cape Colony. They were looking for land uh, in and around South Africa. He'd obviously not made uh, great friends with the Zulus, so at that stage, I think uh, Dingaan had already arranged uh, for Shaka to be moved on, and he was still pursuing um, Zilakazi. And then, of course, you had the local tribes as well who weren't so keen on it. And um, I hope I've got this right with my history, uh, but Mzilla Kazi uh, was very good friends with Robert Moffat. And Robert Moffat had been exploring north of the Limpopo, and he said to Mzilla Kazi that there's a really good spot. You have to go through a couple of granite mountains, and you look out for a flat top mountain, and that plain there is a great place uh, for you to establish a settlement. So with all these pressures happening on him, Mzilla Kazi followed those instructions. Uh, of course, unfortunately, we probably know the story about um, Mzilakazi and Tabas and Duna, in that Mzilakazi got a bit lost, his Nduna settled in the Bulawayo Plains, and when Mzilakazi came back two years later, he wasn't so chuffed, and a few of them didn't last long. Uh, but that's, um, that's how we got to um, Bulawayo. Sorry, I've jumped one ahead. Um, but the idea behind it was that once Mzilakazi set himself up in Bulawayo, um, because of how the Matabili were in terms of their, what they'd learned from the Zulus, it was very difficult uh, for anyone to then enter the territory. He pretty much dominated the whole territory. And his rule, uh, and it was followed on by Lobangula, was that you did not enter Zimbabwe, well, we wouldn't have called it Zimbabwe at that time, unless you go through Bulawayo. So Bulawayo was the gate into, um, into that territory, and Mzilakazi controlled that territory. Um, now, we can go back in history again to the 1890s, obviously, all the pressures, you had the Portuguese in the east, you would have the, the Boers, the four trekkers on the Limpopo border, and of course the British were looking for ways to get uh, further north in Africa as well. And the pioneer column, again, I'm not a history teacher, but just to give you an overview, um, they decided that they needed to get into, into Zimbabwe and set up as, as soon as they could, and they managed to get a kind of a cross signed in the Rudd concession. But it's really interesting, and this is what I find fascinating, is that the pioneer column, for those of us who don't know history, is they chose deliberately not to go through Bulawayo because they knew that they couldn't go through Bulawayo. They had to go around Mzilakazi because he was controlled, oh, sorry, it was Lobangula at that time, uh, and, and get, up, get themselves up. So they chose a route led by Salu um, through, um, through the, the Tuli Circle and then up to, um, well, Fort Victoria is now Masvingo, and then they set up uh, Fort Charter and then Fort Salisbury, which is now modern day Harare. And that's kind of the route they took. And the reason I draw your attention to this is because we've got a very big project uh, which has been proposed in the country now, uh, which is the dualization of the Bite Bridge Chirundu border, uh, Chirundu uh, Highway. And if we look at that highway, okay, we haven't quite gone through the Tuli Circle, but it's really interesting how 
we're kind of following the same route that the pioneers did all the way back then, and that we're saying, actually, let's go around Bulawayo. Let's make sure that we kind of have a route that goes through Masvingo, Chirundu, and up to Rari, and up that way. And that's kind of, I'm being a bit Bulawayo, right? But that's, that's, our, our thinking hasn't changed too much. Bulawayo, for, for whatever reason, is, is always being, um, being missed out. Now, I've, I haven't done any big calculations on it, but I have just drawn, for interest's sake, uh, a proposed route, if we want to try and get, uh, the main reason for getting a route from uh, Bight Bridge to Chirundu is because there's all the through traffic moving, uh, moving through Zimbabwe. And if you did this, instead of going through uh, the other way, it's amazing how it doesn't make too much difference in terms of uh, the miles that you cover. And if you think about trying to create a spine, if you want to have the main road in your country, a dual carriageway, surely you want to pick up the main cities in your in your country. And I think as people from Bulawayo, we should be saying to them, well, why are you not, why are we spending all of this money here when we should be developing a route from Bightbridge? And I'll come into this a little bit later, a, a, an easterly bypass of Bulawayo up through Gweru, Kwekwe, up to Chiroe and up to uh, Chirundu. And that route is just as viable as the one that's currently being proposed uh, by the government. Now, the advantage of doing that route as well is once you've established that as your backbone, because the first um, road in any country is going to be your backbone. It's going to be the road that everyone uses and it's, it's, it's where all your commercial traffic, everything is going to flow. Um, so really, as Bulawayo, we want to be part of it. Nice thing is, once you've got that route, it's only 100 kilometers and you've already joined up the Plumtree border post. So into your spine or your backbone of your country, you've got, um, you've got another country, Botswana, which is linked in. It doesn't take you much longer. You've now got another 300 to 400 kilometers of road and you can link up with Victoria Falls and another border post at the top as well. So very quickly, you've got great links uh, with that highway. Um, and of course, with tourism being a key industry um, for the country, having the Victoria Falls uh, Bulawayo link, people entering from South Africa um, have a very quick access to Victoria Falls, the same as people coming in from uh, Botswana as well. So for me, that would be a much more sensible way to start our road network. If you're going to build up a road network, uh, let's start it that way. And if you want to, you could add a little spur to pick up a Rari um, as well. <laughs> I'm sure they would have done that earlier. But anyway, um, <clears throat> we can include them. Now, um, I'm going to get a little bit controversial. And I think it's always nice. And uh, I've hopefully we've got the free space to be able to just speak and share some opinions. Um, <clears throat> Cecil John Rhodes, obviously a very controversial figure from uh, the previous century. Um, caricatured as someone who dominated Africa, uh, maybe pillaged it for his own benefits and his own wealth. Um, again, you can debate that for a long time, and I'm not here to, to do that sort of debate. I'm just looking at one concept in particular for Cecil John Rhodes, and that was he was wanting to create a railway line from Cape Town all the way to Cairo. And this railway line, if it was done um, in Rhodes's time, would have been completed somewhere between 1905 and 1910. So we just think about that. So over 100 years ago, you would have had a railway line going all the way from Cape Town all the way to Cairo, straight through Africa. So just think about, maybe try and reflect on what's happening on our roads at the moment. How are things moving around Africa? Uh, what would have happened if 100 years ago, we had a corridor going all the way through the center of Africa? What would that do to our trade and all the things that are happening here? I was a teacher for a while. It's good that we've got a couple of teachers here as well. Uh, so I have to ask a question and get some interaction. Does anyone know at this moment in time, if you were to get on, uh, if you were to somehow have a railway locomotive, hitch up a couple of carriages and leave Bulawayo Station, how far would you get if you went north? Anyone would venture a guess at the distances of how far we're going to get if we go north? That's right, Ed. You, you know too much because you've given away my, my trick. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, interesting thing here is, um, yeah, the rail line uh, itself, actually, uh, Zambia was the limit. Um, but actually, during the independence uh, struggles, so um, obviously uh, Zimbabwe and South Africa came in a bit late. And to try and create a bit of resilience for Zambia, they actually created a railway link from uh, Dar es Salaam into uh, uh, Kapiri Maposhi, in Zambia, um, and, but w the interesting thing, and Ms. Uh, White has just alluded to it, is that the problem with um, 
the railway gauge is that if you start in Cape Town, uh, sorry, South Africa, Zimbabwe, uh, Botswana, Zambia, I think Mozambique as well, have got what they call the Cape gauge. So the width of the track is three feet and six inches. Now, if the railway line is built by the Chinese, they build it to one meter. So what's going to happen is you're going to drive your railway, line, railway carriage uh, and you're going to get to a point where the railway is no, now no longer compatible. So you have to take everything off the train, put it onto another train, and then carry on moving. And that actually, they have got a little bit further north than, um, than the Zambian border because the, 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 the Chinese made a line from Dar es Salaam to, um, to Zambia. So midway in, in Tanzania, they've got this, um, this station which is called the, the a brake gauge station. So you have to basically stop your wagons and everything goes off and onto another train. You get to Dar es Salaam and then you can kind of make a couple of interlinks from there. But the point being is that we've lost our ability um, to transport goods um, from Southern Africa into other parts of Africa conveniently. And I'm sure we're probably all aware of the other states of our, our rail. Now, um, I just wanted to highlight one of the, th the key areas where I think we should be focusing on, and, and I think, um, uh, again, MP, you said that uh, Timber's talk last week looked at um, what are the advantages of Bulawayo, and I think, not trying to go back to old tricks, but the railway is definitely a key part uh, to getting Bulawayo going again. Um, I'm going to look at a couple of other routes maybe people haven't thought of yet, um, but there is a route uh, that they've been proposing for a long time between Namibia and Botswana called the Trans-Kalahari. Um, it doesn't include Zimbabwe at this stage, but obviously because we're linked into the, Zimbab uh, the Botswana network, we would automatically have the link to Volpus Bay if they brought it about. Uh, and what they've been considering for their model on it is they are looking at the export of thermal coal from Botswana into Volpus Bay. And they're looking at a break-even price of $68 a tonne uh, to be able to justify the project. And because of the fluctuation in coal prices, uh, they just haven't been prepared to invest the money in the railway. But I don't think anyone has considered putting Zimbabwe into that financial model. So why are we not talking to uh, the people in Botswana and the people in Namibia and saying, well, actually, it's not just coal that you could export, but actually there's a lot that Zimbabwe could benefit from by being downstream or upstream, depending on which way you're going, of that railway network. And um, I think uh, that, that, for me, would be a key, um, a key railway network that we need to get people talking about and investing. Another one, I've just recently come back from uh, the DRC uh, just over a week ago. Uh, next time I go to Bitebridge Border Post, I'm going to think I'm in a first world country, uh, I think, uh, <laughs> based on that trip. But I had, uh, so the, the Zambian, um, Zambian into DRC border, there were 7.2 kilometers of trucks lined up back to back. Coming back the other way, there were 10 kilometers of trucks back to back coming from the DRC into Zambia. Now, that's ridiculous. And in this, in this day and age, um, why are we moving? I can probably answer the question. Uh, it's related to government ministers owning transport companies. But why are we uh, transporting uh, things by road when we can quite simply just put it on a railway wagon and it's there without all the delays and all the other things that are happening? So again, uh, this railway line here is poorly developed uh, between the DRC and Zambia. Uh, and again, if we could revitalize that railway link uh, into the DRC especially, um, it's an up-and-coming uh, country. Actually, the people there are lovely, um, and they, they do deserve um, a lot better as well. But they've got amazing minerals. Uh, cobalt being the main one. Uh, does anyone know why cobalt is significant these days? Another. So it's all got to do with what's happening with, uh, actually, the reduction, ironically, the reduction in coal. Uh, cobalt is used in the electric car motor. So there's a high demand in cobalt, and I think there's only two or three countries in the world that are producing the right grade cobalt, and the DRC is one of them. And actually, um, if they hadn't opened one of the mines for cobalt in the DRC, uh, the pr price of cobalt would have gone up by two or three times. Um, that's how significant the DRC is in cobalt production. Um, so as well as copper, the cobalt comes down as well. And it's something that we need to think about is, can we not tap into that market, provide them nice, easy transport links into there, um, and then instead of sending raw materials out to China or to other countries, can we not beneficiate in Zimbabwe? We've got the brain power to do it. Why don't we do some beneficiation of raw materials rather than just allowing them to pass through our country, damage our roads, uh, things like that. Uh, the other one, uh, this road, this rail network already exists, uh, but you're coming in from Maputo 
up to, um, up to Bulawayo. All of that line exists. It just needs to be refurbished and, and done up properly. And I think that will give you a nice uh, strategic coverage of uh, the rail network. Um, I have deliberately uh, not even looked at South Africa uh, because I think we need, to, as, uh, as Southern Africans, we need to be able to stand on our own feet uh, without relying on South Africa all the time to do everything for us. So the, that there, for me, will give us a nice footprint as Zimbabwe. Of course, we're not going to stop trading with South Africa. It's very important to keep them as a partner. But um, I think it's about time that we started to do things um, without always having to rely on South Africa to provide, provide us with everything. And if we can be part of driving that network forward, uh, then I think we'll do really well. Okay. Okay. So uh, that was kind of like a the macro or larger zoomed out scale, I'm going to try and hone in and be a little bit more specific about our city and what I think we can do, uh, do here. So um, this was one of the diagrams I had to look at uh, during my studies, and it's a nodal analysis diagram. I'm not expecting anyone to do any calculations tonight. But effectively, you have a series of nodes, so the distance between them doesn't matter, but you allocate scores for the route that you travel between each node. And then you can work out, well, what's the best route I can take to get me from, okay, number six to number 12? And there's a very boring formula. It doesn't, you just have to go through it and you enter it in and you work out the, the best path that you travel on. So a couple of examples of that. Um, we've got a lovely, beautiful highway. Uh, it's been constructed and it gets you between two cities. Lovely, great speed, no problem whatsoever. Only problem is if you end up having that happening on your highway and your highway comes to a standstill, um, you have to, we do it without thinking. Again, in Bulawayo, we don't have as many um, issues with this. Um, but you say, okay, well, I'm going to see sitting in that traffic for the next four hours, or I'm going to take the off-ramp, I'm going to take a whole bunch of back routes. It might be a bit much longer, but it's going to get me to my destination quicker. So we're looking at a way that we can save time. Even though we've got the highway, it's still not getting me that, there that quickly. Uh, the other one, um, I'll give you an example uh, of what happened to me a couple of years ago. So time is really important with, with nodes. Is I was coming back to visit my, uh, my family. It was just over two years ago. A few of my friends might know this story because I, I like telling it. Um, and I was trying to work out the best way to get from London to Bulawayo as cheaply as I could. I was basically just flying into Joburg and then uh, getting a flight from there. And uh, I eventually worked out that obviously people know that if you take a direct flight from London to Joburg, it's quite expensive. But if you add a node in, suddenly the price drops down. But I uh, was able to work out that actually if I didn't leave from London, it actually got even cheaper. And uh, so I started looking at all the nodes. I looked at Madrid, uh, Paris, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, and I said, well, actually, let me just play around here. And I got a flight uh, from Paris to uh, Johannesburg for 398 pounds uh, return on British Airways. <clears throat> and it was interesting because the plane took off from Paris, landed in London Heathrow, went directly from London Heathrow to Johannesburg, and it was 398 return. So I thought, like, out of curiosity, let me just uh, let me see what it would have cost me if I just went from London Heathrow to uh, Johannesburg on the same flight, and it was 800 pounds. So by choosing to add distance to my journey, I somehow saved 400 pounds. And all we did is my wife's French or got a French family, so we went and visited my wife's family in France. She dropped me off at a railway station, and I caught the plane from Paris. And then on the way back, it was 35 pounds on the Eurostar. So. I saved a bit of money in that way. So it was, uh, as I said, you just got to try and think outside the box. But I think the point is, if I just want to try and get that kind of thinking in your mind, is you've got to try and think of nodes and think, well, actually, sometimes the straightest distance or shortest distance isn't necessarily the, the best one. It's just, just trying to think outside the box a bit with those kind of things. So um, I'm just trying to sell a bit of a dream here. Uh, this uh, is, people might have heard of it, this is Silicon Valley. Um, does anyone know where Silicon Valley is? California. You guys are too good. Okay. It's in California, which is the United States of America. And if we zoom in further, it's actually um, San Jose, uh, which is just to the south of San Francisco. You've got this, uh, the bay. And then this is the, um, this is the view of, of um, Silicon Valley. Now, the idea behind Silicon Valley, or the reason it's so uh, successful or popular, is you've got Stanford University up to the top. So all that really well-educated people. You've got um, all the IT companies involved there. And suddenly you've got this critical mass of companies and people and think tank, really, uh, who've developed this, uh, that have all, obviously, all the industries, 
uh, interrelate or interlink with each other, and it's just helped to create this uh, this really vibrant and well um, well resourced valley. If we zoom in a bit further, so that's Sanato. I'm I'm going to focus in here. So this is kind of getting into my detail of where I'm proposing. Is right at the centre of uh, Silicon Valley is an airport, and uh, that is effectively the lifeline of Silicon Valley. People can fly in, do their conferences, do their meetings. Um, it's very easy to, uh, it makes the whole thing a lot more accessible. Um, if we zoom to what's happening here in Bulawayo, this is Bulawayo. Obviously, we can spot the difference in development in the town. Uh, but for me, the opportunity, I think, that's Joshua and Cormo Airport. Okay? Again, this is where Mzilikazi would have arrived because he was actually a rover a bit, bit further north, which is why I'm trying to loop it back to the very beginning. Uh, he found the perfect spot, really. Um, this is a completely undeveloped uh, part of land, and I think this is the opportunity that Bulawayo needs to take, is to say, well, what can we do to create a node uh, of world-class standard that's going to develop uh, our city? And the way I would say we should start doing it is, first of all, by looking at the roads. Very straightforward one is you've got the Johannesburg Road here, the Harare Road, uh, that's, I've got, yeah, that's the Turkmine Road, and then, of course, you've got the Victoria Falls Road as well. So creating a bypass from the Joburg Road all the way through picking up the airport, it means that people coming in from Harare or um, Gweru can very quickly get themselves either to the airport or onto the Victoria Falls Road, and the same for people coming in from uh, Johannesburg route, they straight round into, um, into the airport of Victoria Falls. Same for your tourism, anything like that coming through. Um, again, remember we spoke about creating the highway from Bulawayo to Victoria Falls as well. You're straight onto that route there um, too. So that would be step one. Uh, the next one is we want to look at the railway line. Now, um, we've got a very interesting system here in Bulawayo where the railway line is actually way out here and it comes into the town and it kind of meanders and does some weird things. It comes through Papoma, I think it comes through and then it shoots out this way, and believe it or not, there's a reason I put the railway line coming down there. That's because that's how it gets to South Africa. So it doesn't go anywhere that way. The railway line, if you're not aware of the system, goes all the way through to here, and then that, it goes down to Joburg or off to Harare over there. So what I'm proposing we do is instead of going all the way through Bulawayo, we just go straight across to the south of the airport, and get the bypass there. So any transport, trucking, anything coming from Victoria Falls, Zambia, the, we've got Wangi, uh, all of those uh, mines and industry up that side, they're able to get either straight to uh, South Africa. Of course, we've already spoken about the Trans Kalahari, so that could still come down this way. And then, of course, you've got the Harare. You've got uh, easy transport to Zisco Steel, for example, if it came back online in Redcliffe as well. Um, and what I'm saying, oh, what I think we should do, is we should create Again, I've not got into any detail here other than saying that this should be our transport hub. So you've interfaced all of those transport industries. You've got your rail, you've got your road, you've got your air, and there's nothing there that's in the way of what you're doing. So there's no development that's going to stop you. You can build the most modern transport system or the most modern transport node without having to interfere with any existing infrastructure. And the advantage of doing nothing for 40 years is that we haven't, we effectively aren't going to be buying and we've, we've not got the wrong technology. So we can build a 21st century transport hub with all the advantages of modern 21st century life without having to re uh, renovate any of the existing or old stuff. So we can just go straight to world-class stuff uh, there. And then again, if we just remember what we're looking at with um, uh, the Silicon Valley, once you've got your node there, you've got that great transport hub infrastructure, you can then have your development happening all the way around uh, your airport. So effectively what we're doing is we're shifting the whole of the, the concentration of Bulawayo and we're making it hum there. We want to create an engine and a motor that's going to hum to the north of Bulawayo. That in itself, you obviously would put your connections in, will then rejuvenate and revive uh, the rest of Bulawayo as you go. But um, I think also linked in with um, uh, the fact that we've now got NAST and uh, it's taken a long time to get there, but I think NAST is a great institution for us to have here in Bulawayo. We're going to have really well-educated, qualified graduates. We've got all that intellectual capital in the city that we want to try and inject them into some Silicon Valley equivalent. I'm not going to tell you what industry to create there, but you can look at 
Uh, how, how does Amazon function? How do we move goods? We want to try and make things move as quickly as possible. We want to put as, as little barriers in front of people as we can to try and get that, um, that movement to happen. Um, so we've got NUST, we've got the School of Mines, uh, we've got all of those people that we can then filter into, uh, into this system. And that would be uh, my proposal, my, my big idea for, for Bulaway. And I could probably just keep going on at it, but I think already I think a few light bulbs have gone off with other people as well. I'm going to finish uh, with this. Um, now, I don't know if you guys have heard the story, uh, but if you, I haven't seen it myself, but I like the analogy, is that if you put a, a, a bunch of lobsters in a, in a bucket, um, just as if they're alive, they're not dead, as the one lobster is about to get to the top and get himself out, the other lobsters will grab onto him and pull him back down. So he's never going to escape the bucket. And I think that is, unfortunately, as Africans, the mentality that we've got into, is that as soon as we see someone successful in doing something well, we have to pull that person down. And, uh, and we've got to try and change our mindset. We've got to try and be able to support each other and say, actually, how do I encourage this person to keep going? Because actually, once that person gets out, he's probably going to help me and get me, get me going as well. And I think that counts. I'm, I would like to try and also just mention the issue of, of corruption as well. So we might have people who are decision makers or whoever you are. If something lands on your desk and what is your, do you sit there and go, okay, this is, this is a great opportunity for me. Or do you say, how can I help make this work? And that's the attitude that we have to engender in everyone. We can't just hang on to everything ourselves and stop other people developing it if we could get ourselves all working together and not be stuck in a bucket uh, like the lobsters. That would be great. You've been watching Big Talk, a series of power talks by industry and thought leaders that inspire progress and unlock innovation. Big Talk, unlocking the next big thing.